start with chapter four. Sheetal, would you like to read the Sanskrit? Yeah. Shri Bhagavan Uvacha Ivam Vivasvate Yogam Pruktavanaham Abhyayam Vivasva Manave Praha Manu Rikshvakave Abhravit Okay, so this chapter is called Transcendental Knowledge. And we read the translation. The personality of Godhead Lord Shri Krishna said, I instructed this imperishable science of yoga to the sun god, Vivaswan. And Vivaswan instructed it to Manu, the father of mankind. And Manu, in turn, instructed it to Ikshvaku. So, Lord Sri Krishna, how he is addressed as? The personality of Godhead. The Bhagavad Gita is coming in Mahabharat. And Mahabharat was recorded by Srila Vyasadeva. So Bhagavad Gita is also recorded by Srila Vyasadeva. So how is he addressing uh, Lord Krishna throughout the Bhagavad Gita? As the personality of Godhead. So God is a person and his name is Sri Krishna. So it's very clearly written. And the name of this chapter is Transcendental Knowledge. So if we are really interested in transcendental knowledge, then here it is that Sri Krishna, he is the Supreme Lord. Krishna stu Bhagavan Swayam. That's what even is said in Srimad Bhagavatam. So what is Sri Krishna saying? He's saying that he instructed this imperishable science of yoga to the sun god. So he's saying that the knowledge about Krishna the knowledge of Bhagavad Gita is a science, is a science of yoga. So science means where we can practically apply the knowledge. That is what is science, that you should be able to practically apply. That's why it is called the science of Krishna. We can practically apply in our daily life and see the result. It's not some, just some vague idea, you know, something maybe, maybe not. No, it's a science. You can prove it. And then imperishable. And this science is imperishable because it is spiritual. It, it, it's eternal. It's for all time, place, and circumstance. It's not that it's there only for a certain time and not for a certain time. No, just as we are eternal souls, and our relationship with Krishna is eternal. Similarly, the knowledge about Krishna is also eternal. And so Krishna is saying he spoke this knowledge to the sun god. The name of the sun god is Vivaswan. Vivaswan is the name of the sun god. And Vivaswan told it to Manu. Who's Manu? The father of mankind. In one day of Brahma, there are 14 Manus. 14 Manus in one day of Brahma. And so Manu is a post and he's the father of mankind. So Krishna told it to the sun god Vivaswan. Vivaswan told it to Manu. Manu who is the father of mankind. And Manu told it to his son Ikshvaku. That's how the science was coming in the disciplic succession. So Krishna is explaining the, the succession, how the science was coming in the human society. Herein, we find the history of the Bhagavad Gita traced from a remote time when it was delivered to the royal order of all planets, beginning from the sun planet. The king of all planets, the kings of all planets, are especially meant for the protection of the inhabitants. And therefore, the royal order should understand the science of Bhagavad Gita in order to be able to rule the citizens and protect them from material bondage to lust. So this science, Krishna was explaining Bhagavad Gita to the kings because the kings at, at that time, in before in Vedic times, in earlier times, um, people were ruled by kings. There was kingdoms, the whole planet earth was ruled by Yudhishthira Maharaj, you know, after the Kurukshetra war. So, like that, the whole planets, there would be different kings ruling them. And the king needed to be a devotee. That's why he would be called Raj Rishi. That he's a king, but he's a Rishi. Why did they need to be devotee? Because 
it's the responsibility of the king to protect all the citizens of, of their kingdom. And what does it mean to protect the citizens of the kingdom? That they have to make sure that the citizen is happy while living in this material world and at the same time can understand that this is just a temporary part of the journey and so that they could um, engage, engage in spiritual activities, engage in self-realization and make this life the last life. That used to be the responsibility of the king. So we can see, you know, such a great responsibility to be a leader. A leader means one should be uh, the kings. They were supposed to help people to get out of this material world. And if they were not able to do that, then they're not proper kings. So then, of course, then over the ages now, there's no kings, but we have government leaders who are supposed to be protecting us. But we can see we practically have no education that who we are, what is the goal of human life. There is no systematic education given in the, uh, to the children. You know, when we go to school, we are just given modern book knowledge, but not the real knowledge of what is human life meant for. And protect them from what is written here. Rule the citizens, protect them from material bondage to lust. We were reading in the last two times, what was lust? Our desire to enjoy separate from Krishna. So reading on, human life is meant for cultivation of spiritual knowledge, an eternal relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead and the executive heads of all states and all planets are obliged to impart this lesson to the citizens by education, culture, and devotion. Now, this is what human life is meant for. We might say, oh, I'm, I'm in a particular position in my life, and my goal is just to be happy, and I should be happy with my family. My family should be happy, and I should be comfortable, and that's the aim of my life. But what is Bhagavad Gita teaching us? What is human life actually meant for? Meant for cultivation of spiritual knowledge. What is that spiritual knowledge? That we have an eternal relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Can you imagine if, you, if we can able to understand that we have an eternal loving relationship with the most important personality? with the most powerful personality, with the most beautiful personality, with the most richest personality, you know, we should feel happy. Oh, that, I, I have an eternal loving relationship with God. I mean, you know, who am I? But I have an eternal relationship with God. How does that sound? Doesn't that sound good? You know, suppose we understand, oh, I have, a, I have a relationship with the president of a particular, particular country, then we we'll feel, oh, I have protection, I feel powerful, I feel taken care of, kind of. No? But here we are understanding that we each of us have an eternal loving relationship with God. And it's the responsibility of the leaders to teach us this knowledge, to give us this knowledge right in our schools, in our culture, everywhere it should be propagated for us to understand. In other words, the executive heads of all states are intended to spread the science of Krishna consciousness so that the people may take advantage of this great science and pursue a successful path, utilizing the opportunity of the human form of life. So it's the responsibility of the leaders to teach all human beings what is the reason that, hey, you are in a human body right now. What's the reason that you are in this human body? Oh, you are in a human body so that you can uh, revive your eternal relationship with Krishna. This is what is the responsibility of the leaders, the executive heads of all states to spread the science of Krishna consciousness. That's what it is for. 
utilize the opportunity of the human form of life. We have been given this opportunity. It's not easy to get the human life, you know. 8,400,000 species of life. There are 8,400,000 species of life, out of which only 400,000 are human beings. So 8 million species are other than human beings. And so we can see only 400,000. So when are we gonna become, get the human form of life again in this, in this circle, in this cycle of life? There's so many different species. And then they just, it just keeps on evolving. And so again, when will we get this opportunity? So we should grab this opportunity right now. Oh, what is the, the goal of this human life? To cultivate my Krishna consciousness, to reestablish my loving relationship with Krishna. Because in, a, in, a, in the body of an animal, we can't do that. In the body of a fish, we can't do that. In the body of a tree, we can't do that. Even in the body of demigod, it's so difficult to do that. It's only in the human form of life we are able to do it. So reading on, in this millennium, the sun god is known as Vivaswan, the king of the sun, which is the origin of all planets within the solar system. So in this age, you know, in this millennium that's going on, the sun god is Vivaswan. In the Brahma Samhita 552, it is stated, Yakshur Esa Savita Sakala Grahanam Raja Samasta Sura Murti Ashesha Tejaha Yasya Kyaya Brahmati Samrita Kala Chakra Govindam Adipurusham Tam Aham Pajami. Let me worship, Lord, uh, let me worship, Lord Brahma said the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Govinda, Krishna, who is the original person and under whose order the sun, which is the king of all planets, is assuming immense power and heat. The sun represents the eye of the Lord and traverses its orbit in obedience to his order. So Brahmaji, Lord Brahma, the first created being of this universe, after he heard the Srimad Bhagavatam from Krishna, after he realized the knowledge, he was able to see Golok Vrindavan. He was able to see the spiritual world. He was able to see Krishna and he got perfect knowledge. And so he uh, spoke these prayers, which are called Brahma Samhita. So he is saying, Okay, he wants to worship. Worship who? He wants to worship God, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Brahmaji wants to worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And he's saying, what's the, what's the name of the Supreme Personality of Godhead? He's saying, Govinda, Krishna. Govinda, the one who is giving pleasure to the cows. He's a cowherd boy, Krishna. And who is he? He's the original person. So Brahmaji is giving us evidence here that Sham Sundar Krishna, Govinda Krishna, he's the original person. And he's the Supreme Lord, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And it is under Krishna's authority, under Krishna's power, that the sun has so much power and heat. Krishna has given this power to the sun. And because of Krishna, the sun has its ob orbit and it goes around in that orbit. And the sun is the eye of Krishna. So we can see such clear evidence is given to us by the pure devotees. The sun is the king of the planets and the sun god, at present of the name Vivaswan, rules the sun planet, which is controlling all other planets by supplying heat and light. So in our school, yes, I learned about the sun, but I never learned, I never heard that there was a sun god. I never heard that in school. Oh, I, okay, yeah, there's a sun planet, it moves in its orbit, but there's a sun god and his name is Vivaswan. You know, and it's the sun that's supplying heat and light to all the planets of the universe, not only in our solar system, 
or you know just limited number of planets all the planets of the sun, of the universe and why is he rotating he's rotating under the order of krishna and lord krishna originally made vibhaswan his first disciple to understand the science of bhagavad gita so we can see this is how the disciplic succession is coming krishna spoke to vibhaswan vibhaswan spoke to manu manu spoke to ikshvaku so the gita is not therefore a speculative treatise for the insignificant mundane scholar but is a standard book of knowledge coming down from time immemorial so bhagavad gita the knowledge of bhagavad gita is eternal it's eternal it's not only that krishna spoke 5000 years ago to arjuna but he's telling to arjuna that he spoke it millions of years ago to vivaswan so we can see the knowledge which was spoken millions of years ago is still relevant to us today so because it is spiritual knowledge imperishable in the mahabharat shanti parva 348 51 to 52 we can trace out the history of the gita as follows treta yugadauch tato vivaswan manave dadau manuscha loka briti artham suta suta yeksh vakave dadau ikshvakuna cha kathito vyapya lokan avasthitah in the beginning of the millennium known as treta yug this science of the relationship with the supreme was delivered by vivaswan to manu so in treta yug in treta yug so ikshvaku uh, krishna spoke to ikshvaku uh, i'm sorry krishna spoke to vivaswan and then in treta yug vivaswan spoke it to manu manu being the father of mankind gave it to his son maharaj ikshvaku the son of this earth planet and forefather of the ragu dynasty in which lord ramachandra appeared so ikshvaku was the emperor of this whole earth the emperor of the earth he's coming in the ragu dynasty the same rag he's a forefather of the ragu dynasty and then this ragu dynasty is where lord ramachandra appeared therefore bhagavad gita existed in human society from the time of maharaj ikshvaku at the present moment we have just passed through 5000 years of the kali yuga which lasts 432000 years so kalya is for 432000 year you 432000 and we have just passed 5000 years only of kalya so kalya has practically just begun it's just the beginning before this there was dwapara yug 800000 years and before that there was treta yug 1.2 million years thus some Two million five thousand years ago, Manu spoke the Bhagavad Gita to his disciple and son Maharaj Ikshvaku, the king of this planet Earth. So we can see the the history here. We can, we are getting history of millions of years ago, not a history of hundred two hundred years or a thousand two thousand years even. This is two million years. So the age. the age of the current manu is calculated to last some 300 mil 305 million 300000 years of which 120 million 400000 have passed uh, isn't this like some in- inconceivable number it just sounds like some number you know here living even 80 years is like oh wow can you imagine 80 years 90 years oh my god he's 90 she's 90 100 unbelievable somebody is 100 here manu is saying manu is said to have a life which is 305 million 300000 years and out of his age so he's middle aged almost you know almost nearing there kind of accepting that before the birth of manu the gita was spoken by the lord to his disciple the sun god vivaswan a rough estimate is that the gita was spoken at least 120 million 400000 years ago so krishna 
spoke Bhagavad Gita to Vivaswan, 120,000, about 120 million, 400,000 years ago. And in human society, it has been ex extant for 2 million years. So how authentic is this knowledge? You know? 120 million, 400,000 years. It was re-spoken by the Lord again to Arjuna about 5,000 years ago. That is the rough estimate of the history of the Gita according to the Gita itself and according to the version of the speaker, Lord Sri Krishna. So Krishna himself is giving the history that since how long he has given the knowledge of the Bhagavad Gita, he himself is saying it. It was spoken to the sun god Vivaswan because he is also a Kshatriya and is the father of all Kshatriyas who are descendants of the sun god or the Surya Vamsh Kshatriyas. So there is the, the Yadu Vamsh and then there is the Raghu Vamsh, the Surya Vamsh and the, the sun dynasty and the moon dynasty. Lord Ramachandra, he chose to appear in the sun dynasty. Lord Krishna, he appeared in the Moon Dynasty, in the dynasty of King Yadu. So then, because Bhagavad Gita is as good as the Vedas being spoken by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, this knowledge is a Purusheya, superhuman. So what does a Purusheya mean? Purush, Purush, man. We, we are Purush, right? Human beings. And then Krishna, he's called Aparusheya. He's superhuman. He's not a man. He's not human. He's not, he looks, he looks like that, but he is not. He's God. You know, man is made in the image of God, but there is a difference between man and God. So this knowledge is Aparusheya. It is, um, spoken by Krishna himself. So because it is spoken by Krishna, it is perfect knowledge. You see, we, we living entities, because we are in the material body, we are prone to four defects. What is the defects? We have imperfect senses. Uh, we have a um, tendency to cheat. We are in illusion. And we always commit mistakes. So anything we do is affected by either one or all of these things. So if we, we, if we try to give some knowledge, it will be defective because we, we are prone to make mistakes. We are in illusion. Our senses are incomplete and we cheat. So our knowledge is going to be a product of these defects. But spiritual knowledge is not like that. It's up or yeah? It is spoken by Krishna himself. And so that's the reason it is perfect knowledge. You see, we can see all the knowledge which is um, given by human beings. They keep changing. You know, at one time, everybody is like, yes, this is the best discovery. This is the best thesis. After 100, 200 years, there's another person who's refuting the same thesis, which was glorified as the best. Because somebody else found some mistake in that. But nobody can find mistake in Krishna's knowledge. There's no knowledge, there's no mistake in the Vedas. It's perfect knowledge. Bhagavad Gita is perfect knowledge because it's spoken by Krishna himself. Since the Vedic instructions are accepted as they are, without human interpretation, the Gita must therefore be accepted without mundane interpretation. So the way to accept Vedic knowledge is to accept as they are accept as they are, because we, we are incomplete, we are defective, we do not have the perfect knowledge. So we are receiving the perfect knowledge. We should accept it humbly, with humility, with submission, and not, not try to misinterpret it, or maybe according to me is this, or I think it's that, but then that's limited to our thinking, and our thinking is defective, then that's not perfect knowledge. That's again tainted. It has material contamination. The mundane wranglers may speculate on the Gita in their own ways, 
But that is not Bhagavad Gita as it is. Therefore, Bhagavad Gita has to be accepted as it is from the disciplic succession. And it is described herein that the Lord spoke to the sun god. The sun god spoke to his son Manu and Manu spoke to his son Ikshvaku. So it's very clearly written that if somebody is misinterpreting the Gita, misinterpreting the Bhagavad Gita in their own way, and we are reading that Bhagavad Gita, it is not Bhagavad Gita that we are actually reading. We are reading somebody else's philosophy or somebody else's imagination. Although the title, they're just borrowing Krishna's title, Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita means song of God, but they're singing their own song because they interpreted it. So interpretation means it will have defect. And that's the reason we are hearing from Bhagavad Gita as it is, as it is spoken by Krishna, as it is understood by Arjuna. And the way to receive this knowledge is in disciplic succession, in, through parampara, that Krishna speaks the knowledge to Brahma, Brahmaji spoke to Narad, Narad spoke to Vyasadev, Vyasadev spoke to Madhvacharya, like that. To, came to Lord Chaitanya, came to his disciples. Then now it's coming to us through Srila Prabhupada. So we are hearing it in the Brahma, Madhva, Gaudiya, Vaishnava, Sampradaya. So we are hearing from Bhagavad Gita as it is, which is authentic knowledge. It's perfect knowledge. Only thing is we have to accept it without our own interpretation. Is that okay? Yeah. Any questions or comments? Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Uh, I have a question. Uh, yes, please. Are, in the first chapter, as informed in Bhagavad Gita, uh, Krishna and Arjuna, they both came in the center of the Kuru Shetra. But all the doubts all the doubts uh, raised by Arjuna and all the reasons he gave for not to fight the war, that is happening now. He was talking about uh, women being in problem, like you know, all the all the wives of all the soldiers and uh, all the all the problem. I don't I don't remember exactly all the points. Whatever whatever he doubted, it is happening today. Uh, I can feel it. So, is there is there any? I, I actually I haven't read Bhagavad Gita myself the whole, but is there all the all the points, point by point, raised by Arjuna has been answered by Krishna, or Krishna just informed him uh, about from the soul point of view that he and his duty point of view that he has to fight and not to worry and just surrender to me but did he did did krishna inform him all the all the doubts he raised point by point and whatever he whatever he doubted because it is happening today i can i can feel it like you know yeah that's a very good observation yes the 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 Doubts which were raised by Arjuna, it is happening. And Krishna cleared it point by point in chapter two. Because Arjuna was saying it, he's going to be full, getting sinful reactions. So then Arj Krishna gives him the knowledge that you're doing your duty, you're a Kshatriya, so you're not going to get sinful reaction. Then again, Arjuna said that, um, you know, I'm going to be killing the elders of the family. So Krishna has told them that it's the soul, the soul is eternal. They're never going to die. You know, they're going to continue to live. So Krishna, and then he said, oh, I will not be able to enjoy the kingdom if all my family members are gone. Who will I show off my kingdom with? Who will I enjoy it? So Krishna tells him that you do your duty, equipoise, without, um, without the desire for enjoyment. You know, and that is a sage of steady mind. So point by point, Krishna clarified Arjuna's doubts. You know, and it's mostly in the second chapter that he gives him all this knowledge. 
I think five. It was five. Krishna, uh, Arjuna raised five doubts. Yes. Yes. Uh, five doubts. And then, because the first one was, oh, I will get sinful reactions. I, I don't want to fight I'm, because I'm going to kill my superiors. So I'm going to get sinful reactions. So he said, I, I don't want to fight. And then he said, I'm going to have, um, what was, I'm just trying to look up at my notes actually, because um, this comes in the first unit of the Bhakti Shastri. First unit, the doubts that are raised by Arjuna. And okay, so Arjuna says that he, because he said he has to be compassionate Otherwise, he is going to have uh, sinful reactions. How will he enjoy? And then, how does uh, Krishna refute it? Those are uh, in, I'll tell you, Jnana, uh, Krishna tells him in chapter 2, text 11 to 30. Do you want to read those now? If you want, you could quickly look into those. Oh, my, 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 exactly my point is like, uh, all the doubts, it is possible that, like, you know, uh, it is, I don't know, it is possible, but it is, it is, I think it is possible that some of the doubts weren't that very important, or he must have just said it as he was an emotion, you know. So, uh, if that was a situation, so is there any doubt? Which Krishna missed? No, he I'm didn't sorry. miss any doubt. Krishna has clarified all the doubts. I can give you the uh, the the text numbers in which Krishna answers all the doubts. I can send that to you. Whatever questions Arjuna raises and Krishna gives him the reply, I can send you. How does he reply him? In which text of Bhagavad Gita does he reply him? I'll send you. So all the all all of Arjuna's doubts are clarified. That's the reason after hearing the full Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna is willing to surrender, right? That's why he's willing to surrender because all his doubts are clarified. Then, otherwise he wouldn't have surrendered. Still, you know, till the time we still have the doubts in our heart, we will not surrender, isn't it? So. Uh, in in reality, there is possibility, okay, that some of the doubts raised coming in the mind of a devotee, uh, which of course not everything is mentioned in uh, Bhagavad Gita as in as raised by Arjuna. So only that that all the clarity of the doubts will be there hundred percent in Bhagavad Gita. Uh, I I can be I can. I just have this faith. So that's okay. Like, you know, if something is there, something doubt, something small or something very not very important. If I if I if I come across or if I if my mind has some doubts, so I should I, I just have faith that okay, Bhagavad Gita will have the answer to that doubt. Is that is that also is that kind of feeling also okay for me? Yes. Bhagavad Gita has the answer to all the doubts, all of them. Only what happens sometimes is when we are reading it ourselves, we might not be able to understand where is the answer of my doubt. So sometimes that's the reason we need the guidance of a, of a more experienced devotee, a devotee who understands Bhagavad Gita more better than us. That's the reason then we go to that person and ask him, oh, this is my doubt. Can you please help me? What does Krishna say about this? But all our doubts are answered in the Bhagavad Gita. That's the reason Krishna has given the Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna. He spoke it to Arjuna for us. Haribo. Thank you so much. Haribo. 
Only we should know how to look for the answers. And as I said, because we are not very experienced, we might not be able to find it ourselves. So we just approach a more, uh, more senior devotee who's, who's understood the Bhagavad Gita and he can guide us then. Yeah. Thank you for your nice question. It helps to remove the doubts from all of us that if we have any doubts, we just have to refer to Bhagavad Gita. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, I think the, the best thing about association is one person asks a question and everybody gets the answers. That's why association with devotees or doing uh, you know, devotional practice along with devotees is so important. So true. Thank you. Yes. Can yeah. association... On our own, we can't. No? It's, yeah. We'll just probably give up, you know, and no time because we won't be able to find the answers but along with other devotees it makes such a difference yes so true so true thank you yes the importance of association yeah. very very important very important anyone wanted to add anything or any other questions any help uh, in the group in the whatsapp group if the question raised and the answers to the text. At least that yeah, I'll I send it to you. I would like to study, yeah. Sure, I'll send it. I'll send it to you. I'll, I'll put it on the group. Hare yeah, Hare thanks. Hare Bhav. Hare Krishna. Was there anything else? Any other comments? Maybe anyone had something to add, maybe? Or any comment? No? no, but the answer, but answer definitely, definitely there is no one answer to the all the to one doubt. There, there is definitely no, no one answer. So you have to, you have to go through the whole Bhagavad Gita to get the full perspective, right? You see what happens so, is because only five I... question, five question. If you say okay, five question have five five answers, then he doesn't have to like you know. There is no need for eighteen chapters, but. There's no, it's not the, it's not a correct perspective to look around, look at it, actually. We can, we have to read the whole Bhagavad Gita through association or th under the guidance of a spiritual master, then only it's possible to get the correct answers, right? Yes, of course. But if you are saying why there are 18 chapters, because initially Arjuna gave five reasons for his not fighting. So those Krishna has answered in the earlier chapters. But then again, Arjuna puts further questions. As you read along the Bhagavad Gita, you will see that Arjuna is raising other, yeah, yeah, other, right. other questions too. Right. right. You know, so that's the reason it goes on to the 18th chapter. And, and as you correctly understood, yes, we have to understand the full Bhagavad Gita under the guidance of a spiritual master, under the guidance of experienced devotees in the association of devotees. And because, um, you see, we are not very, we are not that smart like Arjuna. Krishna spoke to Arjuna in Bhagavad Gita. Some, some people say half an hour, some people say 40 minutes, some people say one and a half hour, whatever it may be. Maybe for half an hour, maybe one and a half hour. Imagine understanding the full Bhagavad Gita in one and a half hour. Here we try to read Bhagavad Gita full life, yet we are not able to fully understand the meaning of Bhagavad Gita, you know? That's why we have to repeatedly hear it, repeatedly study it. The study of Bhagavad Gita should go and finish one time. Again, it should start. Because the, each time we begin reading it again, we will understand it a little more. It should not stop rather. Ever. Yeah. It's never, not ever, not stop ever. Yeah. Yeah, we should repeat and the it. More read, and the more you read, the more uh, deeper you dive into the meaning of it. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you. So we can understand the caliber of Arjuna, you know. What's his caliber? Can you imagine? He, he understood the full, full Bhagavad Gita in one and a half hour. And he says, yes, Krishna, I surrender unto you. I'm going to do what you tell me to do. No looking back. I don't have any more doubts. And he just fought the war. 
you know. He just surrendered to Krishna in one and a half hour. He understood the full Bhagavad Gita. Well, he surrendered to Krishna initially also. That's why Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita to him. He initially also surrendered. That's how Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita. Then after that, he was like, okay, all my doubts are cleared now. Now I know everything. Now I'm going to fight. Now I'm going to do whatever you tell me to do. So, Bhagavad Gita has to come, bring us to that point that Vasudeva Sarvam Iti, that Lord Krishna, he is everything. And that I am his eternal part and parcel. I have a loving relationship with Krishna. And then let me surrender to his will. What does surrender to his will mean? I was just discussing with somebody today. You know, what does surrender to Krishna actually mean? Anybody, any thoughts, comments? Surrender um, to his Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, one of the, I mean, there are many ways of surrender, but one, uh, at least let me say from my own experience, is uh, what I understand by surrender is to, that whatever happens, whatever happens is his will. If we just firmly believe in that, if we firmly believe in that, uh, we are like surrendering to him. And uh, also if, you know, in our day-to-day -day life also, when we go through different situations, good, bad, whatever, if we completely surrender to him, we just doing it everything in Krishna conscious. So then we are not taking anything on ourselves, And it goes also very smoothly because he, I mean, if you're surrendering to him, he's gonna take care of you, right? But we have to surrender. We don't have to keep that doubt in between or, you know, maybe, maybe not, okay, let me do this. No, it's very difficult, of course, to completely surrender. But slowly, slowly we can, you know, it, it's a habit forming, basically, what I feel, it's habit forming, can't be done overnight. Slowly, slowly, by small, small things, little, little, it just becomes a habit then to put him in, in, in the center of everything and work around it. And just make him the karta dharta, like we say, you know. Yeah. That's what I Thank understand. You. Thank you. Yes, so nice. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anyone else wanted to? Surrendering can also be can can also be like just just uh, hearing and following and like you know and following whatever is said in Bhagavad Gita. Yes, yes. Following the instructions of Krishna. Yes. Of course. Yeah, that, of course. That because if you follow somebody, it automatically means that you have surrendered to his orders or to his words. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Anyone else wanted to add? All good. Yeah, well, I, I was just telling this devotee, you know, Saren, like because we have, there's so many instances which go uh, accord, like L reverse than what we want, you know, many times. Oh, I want this, but something else is happening. What's happening, you know? Krishna, what's happening? You know my heart. I want this, but you're letting this happen. I don't know what's happening. Can I please get out of this situation? Oh, I'm not able to get out of the situation. What do I do? You know, then, okay, I really don't know why you're doing this, Krishna. But I have faith in you. I understand. I don't know why. why I don't understand why am I going through this. I don't know what's happening. But I have faith in you. That you are my best friend. That you understand what is better than me. Uh, better for me than I understand. I think something else is good for me, but you know better than me, you know, because you are my best friend. So then please give me the humility to accept your will because it's so difficult to accept Krishna's will, you know. We want things our way. Oh, my desire, I want this, but something else is happening and I'm wise, I don't want to accept it. So please, Krishna, please give me the humility to accept your will. And you know, according to me, I was thinking that that is surrender. So I just wanted to share that. Yeah. So, 
Thank you so much, everyone, for joining in today, and thank you for your participation. So, shall we stop at on that note and chant one round? Yeah. Bhagavad Gita ki chesh la Prabhupada ki chesh gaur Hari bol, Hare Krishna.